Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here on, in Re on Researching Manala. Uh, every Monday at 1, this show appears. Usually, Jay Fidel is the host. I'm Ethan Allen. I'm filling in for Jay as he is away right now. And helping us out in, uh, here in the studio today is Andrea Gabrielli. Welcome, nice Andrea. Nice to see you, Ethan. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Night. Great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Andre has been here before. He is a uh, research assistant and PhD candidate at, at HIGP, the Hawaii Institute for Geophysics and Planetology, if I got that's that correctly. Right. Okay. That's right, absolutely. And that's part of SOAS, part of UH, so mm -hmm. all, all the different layers there. <laughs> Just like the layers in a volcano, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're going we're to talk about a bunch of things about volcanoes, but particularly about the gases that come out of volcanoes uh, today and about some of the technologies that he's working on to, to sense these gases. So maybe start out just, I assume most of our audience here is from Hawaii and therefore most people probably do know what VOG is, but let's, let's start with the basics. What, what, what is VOG? VOG, um, as they call it here in Hawaii, is basically a volcanic smog. Okay. So it's... Uh, it's formed when the SO2 gas, the SO2, the sulfur dioxide, is released by, by volcanoes, and then it interacts with the atmosphere, and particularly with uh, particles within the atmosphere, rain, sunlight. And so we have this mixture of aerosols, of acidic aerosols and sulfuric acids that, that are carried away by the by the vent by, by the wind, and so they can affect um, the people living downwind of the active volcanoes, and also uh, they can affect animals. Uh, they can affect plants and also form. infrastructures because they are acidic. So sure. They can deteriorate and and impact also infrastructures, buildings, and and yeah. Right, and if there's small bodies of water down, downwind from them, again, that, that can make the water more acidic, which can have impacts on life forms in the water. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So, so it's, uh, and, and uh, we know... And it, rain as well. If it, if it rains and then the, the, the aerosols, uh, these acidic aerosols can precipitate mm. because of the rain, because of the water, so they can affect all right. this. You're yeah. getting dilute sulfuric acid in, yeah. your, in your rain, yeah. Yeah. which is not, not particularly what you want most oh, of the yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to drink that. <laughs> right, and we, we, we know well in, in Hawaii because depending on how the wind goes, sometimes yeah. sometimes we get a, a good deal of vibe over here in Oahu, usually not too much, but, but we all, all do know it. So yeah, and we, we, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, in fact, um, um, I brought uh, um, one, maybe if we can have the first... Uh, first slide? Uh, yeah, so sure. we can... Okay, here, for example, you can see exactly what we're talking about. These are the Hawaiian Islands, you can see them. And this was taken by a NASA satellite, mm -hmm. which is MODIS. This is a visible image. Right. And yeah. you can see um, the... It, it, it was taken during a standard uh, train width day, so you can see the clouds uh, right. forming on the windward side of the islands. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can also see within the uh, um, red line that I drew, you can see this uh, haze, this, right. this, uh, this, um, this um, hazy um, gas that swirls sure. after the, the, um, um, to, the, to the left of the big island right. and that's basically the vog so you can see you can see from space you can right. see it from space and you can see how large this plume is right. and so that's why when for example low pressure system comes closer to the islands then we can have corner winds southerly winds that that bring up all these this gases all this haze right. towards the the, the all the islands and even even Oahu even Oahu sometimes can be affected. You can right. sometimes from for example from my from my um, window I can't even see the Waianae Mountains in the distance because of the haze and all that. So yes, yeah. Uh, people people start complaining about it here very, very quickly. Yeah. They, say they yeah. have trouble breathing and get uh, attacks and all. Now the the thing that you're in, in particular interested in is not just the VOG itself, but it, it's the gases within it, because these gases can tell us a good deal about the VOG, and they can help us understand what's sort of going on under the ground in the volcano, right? They can help, yeah. uh, because their composition will change depending upon how the magma, the liquid rock in the, uh, underneath the volcano is sort of turning over and churning and bubbling away, right? 
absolutely. In fact, the, the, these studies that we are actually carrying out uh, at the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology are important for two main reasons. The first one is the one you just mentioned, that studying these gases can tell us a lot about what's going on within the plumbing systems of, of volcanoes. Mm -hmm. So whether magma is rising, whether eruptions are imminent. But also, as we mentioned at the beginning, it's important to, start to actually monitor the fluxes sure. from these volcanoes, so the amount of gas which is released within a certain amount of time, right. to, uh, to um, survey uh, and, and try and predict the quality of the air for people sure. who live downwind active volcanoes. Right, so asthmatics can take proper precautions and either stay indoors or put on appropriate yeah. masks or wh whatever may, uh, may need to be done. For example, the um, one uh, uh, a main concern for people living on the Kona, on the west side of the Bay Island, so in, in, in Kailua Kona, is basically that um, that area is uh, um, sh um, is in a trade winds shadow mm -hmm. because the huge mountains of Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea block the trade winds. Mm -hmm. So that area is subjected to um, daily wind pattern which is different from those that we can see in other locations. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that as the land gets hotter and hotter during the day, the, the ocean stays at the same temperature. And so a wind, that because of this temperature difference, uh, winds starts to blow from the ocean up to mm -hmm. um, the land. On sure. the, and so, so clouds start to form there. So as the, uh, as the wind blows up this air towards the Hualalai Mountains, mm -hmm. Mauna Loa slopes, then also fog gets accumulated there. So that, that's a serious concern, especially in the afternoon for these areas and locations. And there are days where the fog is, is, uh, is actually thicker. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's difficult. It's like a fog. It's like, sure. a, it's like a fog. And, um, Except again, it's, it's a, a more of a, 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 a irritating fog. And if, yeah. if, for instance, you're trying to grow young plants, young plants would be particularly susceptible to the, to the acidic nature of, the, yeah. of that. Yeah, it's sulfuric, it's acid. Yeah, and right. so that's why it's... Uh, right. And there are lots of studies going on um, whether this fog is... is uh, um, what are the long-term effects uh, on the people living there? So there are lots of studies going on about this. Um, but we want to, act in order to try and predict mm -hmm. where the VOG is going to go so that people can get alerts and everything, um, we want to measure these gases as they are released sure. from the source. And so this is, this is exactly what we're doing. With right. And so I, uh, we have another picture here, I think. That yeah, you can so bring the, the second picture. Sort of a more this of a close-up. So here, here we're looking at the source. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the source of, of the, one of the, one of the two sources of the VOG at the current eruption of Kilauea volcano. So this is a picture we, um, we took uh, during an overflight uh, from a helicopter. You can see part of the helicopter on the right of the image, and this is Pu'u'o'o vent. This mm -hmm. is the active vent on Kilauea. It began eruption on January the 3rd, 1983. Mm -hmm. That's the current ongoing eruption, the Pu'u'o'o Kupainaha. And since the beginning, it has um, been continuously releasing lots amount of gases, including water vapor, sulfur dioxide, and carbon dioxide as well, being a source of VOG and concern for people. But mm -hmm. um, between 2002 uh, and 2007, the amount of gases which were released by the volcano were uh, in metric tons per day. They were about, according to USGS estimates, uh, 140 tons, me metric tons per day. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a bit of, of sure. sulfur dioxide, which then can uh, interacts with the atmosphere and forms the fog. Mm -hmm. But since the new vent, mm -hmm. the new vent within, uh, at the summit in 2008, uh, a new vent opened up in, within the Halema'oma'o um, vent. Uh, since then, 
the amount of fog has severely increased because mm -hmm. now now we're seeing uh, uh, now we're seeing fluxes of 800 Ooh. metric tons per day. Wow, that's so nice. severely increased. And since mm -hmm. 2000, since 2008, we actually saw this this increase in emissions mm -hmm. because now now what we're having there are two vents. Mm -hmm. So one is degassing along the East Rift zone, mm -hmm. and the other one is degassing at the summit. Okay. So that's quite a bit of fog, especially for areas immediately downwind. Mm -hmm. These vents, like Pahoa, for example. Right. Or again, as, as we said, if the winds are coming from the south, even, even Hilo. Hilo is actually closer than Kona, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if, the, if the winds uh, are blowing from the south, then Hilo can be completely mm -hmm. uh, covered in, in, in fog. So. And, and because these vents are in two different places, they're actually being fed from slightly different chambers of magma, and, and the, the gases vary a little bit between them? The gases vary a little bit between them. Yeah, they, they're, 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 um, these are, they, this is what volcanologists call a two stages uh, degassing. Okay. Because basically, gases are being released uh, at the summit uh, where there is, um, um, the, they call it the, 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 central, the, the, the central magma chamber. There is, a, there is a reservoir that started to form after the new vent opened up. That's, they call it the South Halema'oma'o Reservoir. And then there is a path that goes along, th that's, the, that's an area of weakness within the volcano that they call it the East Rift Zone. Okay. And from the summit, magma can travel within these cracks and gets to Po'o'o. Oh. So the, the gassing is, is slightly different in mm -hmm. composition. They call it two stages degassing. Sure. Um, but the fact that now there are two vents mm -hmm. degasses is, has dramatically increase the, the, the problem of the fog is here in Hawaii and, and, uh, and, um, um, and also the, the, the especially, especially as I said in Kona and other areas which are uh, sure. threatened by that. Well, excellent. And we're, we're going to explore this whole phenomenon a lot further and get, get deeper into the area of the sensors that you use after a short break here. But right now, we're going to take a little break. We'll be back with, in, with Research in Manawa. Uh, I'm your standing in host, Ethan Allen. We'll be right back. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Hi, I'm Stan Energy Man, and I want you to be here every Friday. Noon, thinktechhawaii.com. Watch the show. Be there. I pity the fool who ain't. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around, we'll see you then. And you're back. Thanks for joining us again at Research in Manoa, Monday afternoons at one each week. Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, filling in for Jay Fidel. And with me today is Andrea Gabrielli from HIGP, we'll just call it, the Hawaii <laughs> Institute for Geophysics and Planetology. And we've been talking about VOG and, and the gases in VOG and the, the, the ups and downs of VOG. But really, Andrew, your work is on sensing these gases and determining how much gas is being released how fast. Because obviously, if you're going to uh, start predicting the, impact, the impacts of the VOG, you need to know how much toxic gas is being released. So the, the, the third slide that we have here shows uh, one of the, your instruments set up, uh, I guess more or less on site, sensing this, testing this gas. Can you begin to tell us a little bit about the uh, instrument? Sure. This is, a, um, this is an instrument um, 
we, it, it's, a, it's a spectrometer. It's an imaging spectrometer. So now, now let's just stop here. It's a, actually, <laughs> it's a thermal infrared hyperspectral imaging spectrometer. That's the mistaken. complicated name. <laughs> <laughs> But, well, that's, that's one of the things on Likeable Science I host. I try to get people to break down their science into simpler terms. So, so tell me a little bit in simpler terms, what, what is a spectrometer then? So they are, um, it, 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 we brought this instrument um, over to the volcano to actually test it and see how well we can, um, we can detect these gases, retrieve this concentration to try and... and, and uh, see in terms of fluxes information and, and how well we can retrieve them. And so here we are looking at uh, our instrument. Uh, we brought it uh, um, there. Um, this, was, this picture was taken in July. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is uh, we're basically measuring uh, infrared light. So we are in the infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum so, so heat. coming so, yeah, it, it's, right. a, it's a, a thermal radiation, right. basically, that we're measuring from the background. Okay. This is, this is uh, the rad radiation comes uh, through the, uh, from the sun, from the atmosphere, from right. the top of the atmosphere, and, the, and it comes, um, it gets to the plume, mm -hmm. and then here, because in, within the plume there are molecules which are infrared active. Right. So these are specific molecules, SO2, the sulfur dioxide, which can emit and absorb infrared light at specific frequencies. Okay. So what we're doing is we're measuring the light coming from um, um, the background, coming from beneath the plume, um, coming from the background, and from the plume itself, because the plume has also a temperature, so is emitting photons. Right. So we're measuring this budget of infrared lights. Uh, this is called the spectrum, particularly. Right. Right. We're, looking, we're looking between 8 and 14 microns. So this right. is what they call the thermal infrared. Right. And what we're doing is uh, we're trying to identify the SO2 signatures, okay. uh, the SO2 features that we can see in this spectra. Okay. So for example, it's like if you, if you, if you think about fingerprints, in mm -hmm. terms of fingerprints, we're trying to detect uh, the fingerprints of the SO2 gas. Right. And so SO2, the sulfur dioxide, will, when, it's, when it's excited, when it's stimulated by some infrared light, will actually then re-emit infrared of, uh, with sort of different little peaks. Some peaks at, say, 900, and another little peak at 1,100, exactly, yeah. or something like it, that. It, it, it emits infrared light right. because the SO2 has a temperature right. at these specific wavelengths. Right. But it also absorbs part of the light which comes from the background. Right. So we are me what we're measuring is basically a combination between emission and transmission. And we're measuring these, the, the, these terms coming from the SO2. Mm -hmm. And by looking at these uh, um, variations, uh, we're basically, we're basically um, detecting right. the SO2 gas. Right, you're measuring it. And so now this, here, this, this is showing how you're sort of calibrating this whole thing, right? This is, this is uh, um, so when we actually, so the main point, uh, here you can see our instrument on the left, uh, and then you can see it has a, a gas cell, the cylinder, the gray cylinder with a yellow uh, aperture, with a yellow, that's a window. Right. It's basically a gas chamber. Mm -hmm. That's a gas chamber where we put the SO2 gas in. And the main point is these cameras can extremely well detect uh, these radiances, these, right. these variations in these fingerprints we were talking about of right. SO2. But the main problem is how we can go from radiances on, uh, to concentration. To, mm -hmm. They call it the, the concentration along the viewing path, so sure. the path concentration. Right. And so this is a series of experiments we've been doing. The S, we put SO2 gas within the chamber, right. and then we know the amount of gas which right. we right. put the in there. Right. And also the material is a, is a specific a kind of plastic, right. which we chose, uh, we built these gas cells actually, right. and we, we chose this material because it doesn't react with the SO2, so we want to make sure the SO2 which we put in there right. stays in there. Right. 
And so we know the SO2 of the gas, right. and so we can basically test how well we can retrieve a known right. concentration of SO2. Right. Once we know the instrument works well, performs well under right. various conditions, then we can apply it to right. Kilauea and then actually measure right. um, these gases. Right. And then in the field, and I think the next set of pictures which shows this, because you get these very different conditions, these different backgrounds, which have different infrared signatures. But because you now have calibrated your machine so carefully, you can actually pick out the SO2 and see if it's maybe very c consistent between those fluxes, although you couldn't tell it from just looking at it. So the, the, the main point, uh, the main problem, the main uh, concern we find in the with field situation is that uh, uh, the, the budgets of infrared light we were mentioning before changes. Right. So basically, here, for example, we can see two pictures um, I took exactly on the same day mm -hmm. of the gas plume at Kilauea volcano being released by Halemaumau. So on the left, that's a picture we took in the morning. On the right, you can see a picture we took in the afternoon. The background right. changed because right. there we have clear sky and on the right we have uh, clouds. Right. Now the problem is that uh, because we're measuring these uh, combination of emission and transmission, mm -hmm. we don't want the background to interfere right. with what we're doing. So basically, in other words, uh, we don't want uh, to measure, we, to retrieve a concentration of SO2 in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, in the afternoon, because the background changed, uh, we don't want to measure another concentration. So we want to sort of remove right. the background effects because we don't want to be, right. uh, we want to obtain the concentration in the plume, the actual right. concentration in the plume, without being related to the background. In other words, uh, right. we want to um, we want to make sure we're actually measuring the volcanic SO2 sure. and not an effect uh, which is related to the changing background. Right, right. So, sure. uh, assuming, of course, assuming the SO2 is constant between uh, the morning and the afternoon pictures, uh, mm -hmm. we should be able to retrieve the same concentration. Mm -hmm. So this is why we're studying uh, different backgrounds, uh, different uh, um, conditions, different atmospheric conditions. So right. if it, whether it's raining, whether it's, it, it's uh, hazy, whether there are cirrus clouds, cumulus clouds, right. Uh, right. and everything. You even do some, I think, if we jump maybe another picture to a head, you've, you've done some of this at night, actually, even. Uh, we tried, but before that, uh, here is another picture, um, as I mentioned. We want to make sure we can retrieve the correct concentration of gases mm -hmm. within the plume, no matter the background. Mm -hmm. So here, for example, we uh, the other set of experiments we we carried them out in the lab. But here you can see we are on um, on the roof of the um, one of our buildings at uh, at the University of Hawaii on campus, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I put the gas cell again in front of the instrument and we're scanning across the sky. Okay. As you can see now, the sky, we have some nice some high altitude clouds. These mm -hmm. are cirrus clouds. Okay. And uh, we know again the concentration of right. gas which I put in the gas because I put right. it in there. Right. So, so that, I want to make sure that we can get it back. We right. can retrieve the same right. concentrations you can, you can, you can, using various techniques. Right. You can pull pull that background off of it now, basically, and get an authentic reading. Full reading. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And how about how about the nighttime shots here? Because I, I gather that this is oh yeah this is an interesting uh, um, story because um, the good thing about these instruments this uh, using infrared uh, imaging spectrometers uh, right. is that uh, these instruments work at night right because heat heat is traveling through because it, it, right. it, it, in the infrared in the infrared parts of the spectrum then right. we can see. For example, there are other techniques such as UV, right. ultraviolet-based uh, devices, and mm -hmm. those basically don't work at night. So it's extremely important, for example, if you want to make sure that uh, the, what, what's happening to the plume at night, or if you think uh, bro the broad pictures, for example, 
if you wanna if you wanna predict vol different volcanoes here we're, we're we're looking at Stromboli in Italy for example. If you want to look at other volcanoes, then vol volcanoes, for example, that are uh, in places where um, near the, the poles, for example, where during the Arctic winters uh, or the, uh, the yeah, Antarctic yeah. winters where there, there, it's always night, then you can't uh, uh, measure those gases because you don't have instruments. Right. Um, for example, um, if we bring up uh, uh, another slide, I think it was there was another one. Uh, oh yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. This is a picture I took uh, flying over Iceland. Okay. So I was on an aircraft, uh, and you can see uh, that's the, that that volcano is called Eyjafjallajökull. Now some 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 friend of mine from Iceland might say, "Oh, <laughs> you're pronouncing it wrong." And, uh, but this is uh, Icelandic uh, names are particularly sure. tricky. To uh, hopefully I said it right, but uh, it's it's an Iceland, so it's covered in ice, mm -hmm. and uh, the, that volcano it started to erupt dramatically in 2010, and the ash cloud it produced uh, threatened, disrupted sure. the whole um, air circul a a air trips uh, right. over Europe. Right. So, uh, detecting get, gases yes. in these locations during winter time, where, where when it's always tricky. dark, right. it's particularly important. So that that's where these instruments can actually make a difference. Exactly. Well, this, this is great. I mean, this is uh, you've given a, a great overview of why, the, why you're, the work that you're doing is so important because it has all these different implications and applications for people nearby, for people far away, for people in commercial air travel, for people in high latitudes and different times of day. So wonderful. And, and, and furthermore, I, I congratulate you. you. You really did explain that the uh, thermal infrared hyperspectral imaging spectrometer very well. And, and I have a much better sense now if that device <laughs> does and works. So I want to thank you so much for being here on Research in Manawa. It was a, a real pleasure talking with you and uh, very educational as uh, thank you very much. your group thank always you. is. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Take thank care. You. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha.